Hello, everyone. Um, yes, we're back once more. Yes, thank you for including us into the program. Together, three of with three of my colleagues at OSA. Uh, Darius, Janos, and Josh, we are happy to present our collaborative audiovisual digital preservation project to you at no time to wait for. The Open Society Archives was established in 1995, and it is part of the Central European University, CEU. This was the year, 1995, when Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty was closed down in Munich. Thank you. Germany and moved to Prague, the Czech Republic. Uh, Radio Free Europe's research institute's massive archive and library was deposited at OSA, and it is our first fund. It is a special Cold War and human rights in itself. As of 2019, uh, OSA has over 200 funds, and the um, holdings comprise of um, of the audiovisual holdings comprise of over 15,000 hours of time-based media. Approximately 80% of them are on analog media, <laughs> film on celluloid, video and audio cassettes, and some open reel tape. I will talk about it later. OSA also has about half a million photo, mainly prints, but also 35 millimeter, both black and white, and uh, color negatives, 35 millimeter negatives. OSA's video is on VHS, SVHS, HI8, Betacam SP, Mini DV, and some Umatic. The digital video is, of course, growing as we also generate and receive collections in the digital format. And it's getting bigger and bigger, and it is yet unconsolidated, meaning we don't have a digital video preservation project in, uh, in, uh, uh, as of now. Uh, running. Uh, it is scheduled as uh, our next project for the year 2020. The audio and photo formats are less uh, diverse. We have quarter inch open reel tapes and audio cassettes, black and white and color prints, and 35 millimeter negatives. And again, a growing number of digital audio and photo with various codecs and various compressions. Some of the highlights, because we are the host institution and we are also quite a young uh, archive, I thought I will talk a little bit about our collections to you. So out of the um, over 70 collections, I would like to present about 10. So we have the Hungarian Interior Ministry uh, instructional films, propaganda films, video interviews with um, the survivors of the Chernobyl disaster by the Nobel Prize winner Svetlana Alexievich. We also have the Hungarian amateur films, that is home videos or home movies, in multiple formats, because we received it from the donor in Super 8, 8 millimeter, um, but also on Betacam SP, and then uh, in MOV files, and actually Peter Forgetsch is just here doing research today, so maybe he can hear that. He, there, he, there he is, and I, he wants us to, uh, to, to donate his own uh, um, uh, digital video to us, and I'm trying to walk out of this negotiation. Uh, our off-air recordings, uh, we also have the off-air recordings of the Soviet and Russian central television. International and Human Rights Law Institute's video archive about the wars in the former Yugoslavia. The single largest independent media groups called Fekete Doboz, or Black Box, a video archive relating to the regime change in, uh, change in Hungary. An orphan collection of Soviet propaganda films. And the uh, Russian language broadcast archive of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, from the first year of its operation in Russia, 1953, until actually, instead of sticking to the uh, principle that we are a Cold War archive, so we are basically collecting material until the end of communism, which is 1990, but because of the wars in the former Yugoslavia, in this case, particular case, we extended the range, the time range, and we have this Russian broadcast uh, until 1995. This is a massive and beautiful collection with over 26,000 audio files. 
digitized by in Prague by Radio Free Europe. So we got them as sort of born digital. So in archive, it's in, in our own archives, it's considered born digital. And we also have a video archive of the uh, last weeks of the Saddam regime through off-air recordings of the Iraqi Central Television and the Physicians for Human Rights training videos and the Genocide Archive of the International Monitor Institute, Los Angeles. By 2012, most of OSA's collections have reached a critical age. Even though OSA has an okay cold storage, an analog to digital conversion has had to be scheduled. At the AV unit, we have created a full inventory of all of our holdings, extents and formats, age of analog carriers, their copyright status, and whether or not the material was intellectually processed was determined. Combining these factors, a priority list was created for scheduled digitization. By 2016, a business case was created as a collaborative project between AV and IT, my colleagues, and um, the management that resulted in an institutional commitment. A budget was allocated for a long-term digital preservation and terms of reference was fra uh, phrased to invite uh, an external expert, uh, that is a consultant. A consultant was to assess OSA's capability for long-term digital preservation to define standards, systems, equipment, and workflows for digitizing and managing AV content, and to develop a digital preservation strategy. The consultancy took place in 2017 in March. It was built on the understanding of the reference model for the open archival information systems, and that there is a readiness to learn and a set of skills for transcoding and using FFmpeg at OSA. Because we were considering of buying into, a, a, into a, a monolith system or rather going for microservices-based uh, solutions, it was still not sure. But when the consultant came and the two-day consultancy included tra a training session in FFmpeg and QTools, we were reinforced that actually we can do it uh, ourselves. So in July 2017, a paper called, titled Microservices in AV Archives was ready, and actually the consultant published it because he is Dave Rice. So it, it was published. So this workflow, the ver in which workflows and tools were defined and designed. I'm going to conclude with the sketch of, the ver of workflow one, uh, that is digitizing digitization and pre-ingest, and then we'll give the floor to my colleagues to continue with the next phases. Workflow one is a manual part of the workflow managed by the AV archive team. It starts, all my team is here. Zoltan is shooting, Darius is, uh, is the next presenter, and also our colleague, the rest of the colleagues are in the audiences. So it is um, managed by the AV archive team. It starts with raw materials that are the analog masters. In scenario one, the contents is already described. So there is a full set of uh, descriptive metadata within the finding aid module of the AMS. In scenario two, only the container records are ready within the AMS. The contents will be described following digitization through physical barcoding, then chipping the barcode into the AMS, digitization through uh, virtual dub. Uh, we are digitizing that directly into FFV1. Uh, quality control and approval, the preservation master FFV1 file is created onto an external HDD and is ready for submission to IT. Now I give the floor to Darius, thank you. So, yeah, hi. Uh, um, I'm briefly going to just speak about how we go on through with upgrading our workstations uh, for digitization uh, and what we have encountered during the process. Uh, it's it's going to be basically about hardware right now. Like maybe this is something nice to have. Uh, 
So our old chain of equipment was uh, quite outdated. Um, what you can see here, that's what we had. Mm, we were di digitizing in, in YUV 4208-bit TV, which is in, uh, in 2017 was quite outdated already. But after having Dave Rice with us, uh, we were committed to upgrade our chain of uh, equipment for video digitization, and we started to acquire the missing pieces. And of course, we had the same thing, uh, and no, I'm saying the obvious here. We had some VTRs and VCRs, and then we acquired some Blackmagic analog to SDI converters, then the capture cards, which is a Blackmagic uh, Dackling Mini. And our aim was to basically digitize in YUV422 10 bit FFV1 um, through virtual dub, what uh, you already mentioned, and what forked we got from, from Peter, actually. <laughs> so, yeah, so the very first we've encountered the problem that the TVC, what we use, the time-based corrector, what we use for VHS, and uh, in, in this chain with the Blackmagic analog to SDI converter, they don't get along well, to be honest. Like, so many drop frames, so many uh, double frames, and we never get, got the reports of that as well. So we had to find a professional time-based corrector for, for, uh, for a digitization project. After almost half a year, we finally found one broadcast one, a used one, of course, uh, a, a, a Snell and Wilcox um, uh, IQH3A, a modular enclosure, with six uh, IQ DAC frame synchronizers, which done the job pretty well, uh, and, and we finally started to do the project. Of course, we had to stop a bit as well, because to be honest, we didn't really know that through the, reading the spe specifications and doing the research, we couldn't 100% uh, uh, say that we are going to have actual 10 bits at the end, like through the chain, what we are using. So we started to test our equipment. We were using QC tools and FF probe. And then we sti finally started to digitize uh, our mat material. Uh, we really didn't have any issues then unless the few times we, we encountered some sync issues, but with updating, to, uh, updating virtual dub to version 43385, these things got remedied, hopefully, at least. Uh, after, done, after we've done anything from the Gazette through digitization and we checked manually, like, the quality is okay, um, we check the, uh, yeah, we check the results that everything is good, we go, to, to, AMA, to the AMS as well. We are checking the, that the barcode, the unique ID is matching, and if everything goes well, we are sending the, HD, uh, the HDDs to IT for further implementation. And one thing why I would like to do a little detour, to be honest, and this is basically a question and, and, and a suggestion, and maybe like at the end or at the restaurant you can tell me that it's nice to have open source hard, uh, software, but we should maybe start opening up our hardware as well. Like, um, uh, I don't know, like sh maybe you know a platform where, where everybody is sharing their blueprints or service manuals or anything like that. Tell me, I would really, really be happy because these obsol uh, obsolete hardwares, it's really hard to fix and really getting through uh, with one of the time-based corrector uh, manufacturers, like we were constantly mailing to each other and was begging just, please tell me the list of error codes and I never got that at the end. Like, they said, like, yeah, send it, send it to us for 350 bucks. So if you have any suggestions for this, please send me either an email or tell it to me later on. And that's about it. Thank you.